a night of wonder, a day of trembling, time to gather in comfort and in prayer and witness to the power of God even amidst death on a cross. For Almighty God, look with mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May our voices be united in our hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. we change the clock of time, for it stands still on this day as we watch now tomorrow in vigil and await for Easter, for the before time becomes the current time, the time of God's inbreaking again upon the world. The hymn we just sang so gloriously defines this week time of triumph on that Palm Sunday, but a foretaste of change. Last night, Jesus, in the scripture readings, would talk to us about being a servant of all, to bow before another in humility, to cleanse each other. He taught his disciples, of course, to go and cleanse others, to forgive their sins, to heal them, to give them the power of the Spirit in his resurrection. But up until this week, they seemed all a little confused, a little lost. And then this week comes in the events we now read. Beginning in the first verse of the 18th chapter of John's Gospel. After Jesus had spoken these words, that is his prayer to God, that he commended his life to God and God his Father would be with him, he says... He went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And he replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. 
Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So that if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom the Father gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. I am not to drink the cup that the Father, am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas is the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter, another disciple, followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of his man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? And those who heard what I said to them, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who believes who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth?
swamp, this lonesome valley, he had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. Jesus went and stood his trials. He had to stand them by himself. Oh, nobody else could stand them for him. He had to stand them by himself. We must walk this lonesome valley. We have to walk it by ourselves. Oh, nobody else can walk it for us. We have to walk it by ourselves. Let's go and stand our trials. We have to stand them by ourselves. Oh, nobody else can stand them for us. We have to stand. After he had said this, that was when Pilate says, what is the truth? Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the crowd, Look, I am bringing out him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. And the Jews shouted back, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he, was claimed, he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate, therefore, said to them, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, here is your king. 
And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. So Pilate handed him over to be crucified. power of these words. Really not the power of the words, the image they create. So evocative. Certainly one to be acted out. I've talked about that before, the seven stages of Pilate going back and forth in the scene, nervously shaking his hands, pleading with them that certainly this cannot go forward, and the crowd shouting, led by those in authority, to be rid of Jesus. When he's presented to the priest and he defends, he says a statement of truth. And the response is to slap him across the face. When Pilate hands him over to the guards, they dress him and mock him and spit on his face, slap him again. But yet, the deed is done, as we'll hear in the next reading. The deed is done. Pilate and the crowd, as we sang, no one is to really be excused from this. No one's hands are clean. The Jews couldn't crucify a person. It was against the law. Crucifixion was a Roman punishment who they reserved for criminals and outcasts, dissenters, those that threatened the state, political troublemakers, usurpers, false kings. No one's quite sure what Pilate does throughout the centuries, why he capitulated. Perhaps he wanted to keep the peace. It is the Passover, as we just heard, there could be 200,000 pilgrims in Jerusalem. It's noon. They're soon to go to temple at sundown and begin the Passover meal. Certainly, Pilate didn't want a riot. For he would be removed if there was a riot. He would be removed if the temple quit paying the taxes Rome demanded. But just like the crowd, he cowers in fear at the decision he must make. Certainly that is the case. The crowd eggs him on, knowing they need Pilate to be complicit with them to get the deed done. Now, they could stone him as a blasphemer, but they'd rather use the power of the state to do their dirty work. To be rid of him once and for all. The man who came as a baby. I love that phrase in Philippians, who emptied himself of the power of God so that he could be with the people. Humbled himself, it says. Here is a man who both surrenders to the will of his father with the cup he must drink of sour wine, we will read of bitterness and tears. There's a wonderful phrase from the preacher to the Hebrews in the 13th chapter that he bore our sins outside the city gate. Outside the city gate, even the ancients said it was near the garbage dump is where they crucified people. Outside the city, cast aside like the burnt offerings in Leviticus, once the offering is done, they throw the carcass in a heap outside, unsuitable to be eaten, disposed of, forgotten, they hope. But I love it, that phrase in the preacher to the Hebrews, he bore our shame outside the city gates. He bore our shame. 
that is, we are unworthy. The crowd sits and shouts. Those that waved palms now are in the crowd going along with the powers that be. I am sure they are afraid. Such is the will of the crowd. His own disciples flee, of course. Peter hears the cock crow, he who is defender of Jesus, the stone, of course. Sitting there by the fire where people warm their hands in the courtyard, that ancient time to still that primitive essence of gathering by a fire to warm themselves. And he is spotted and heard from his voice and seen. They see his face, accuse him of being one. He says, no, you have it wrong. You are mistaken. He too flees. We'll soon read only his mother and a few others can look upon the sight, can look upon his face. And I wonder what they saw. Look upon a face. You know, Jesus fed 5,000 people. He answers to the triumph cries of save us, save us. But not even at such moments. No one says this is the Son of God. There have always been heroes who marched in triumph. There will be others. There will be other miracle workers, clever tricksters, some of them. But none of them adds up to being the Son of God. None of them with powers we do not understand, but none of that adds up to being the Son of God. Mark's gospel will record only twice that Jesus is the Son of God. At the very beginning when he comes to earth, it'll talk about this is the gospel of salvation, the Son of God, his story. And the only other person that will recognize him will be the centurion who looks upon his face hanging on a cross. He says, surely this man must be the Son of God. Last year, the wonderful preacher and chaplain, Fred Beekner, wonderful storyteller, he used to tell a story about Le Fellini's film, La Dolce Vita. It was happening in a college town movie house, probably on a Friday night. The sun has just gone down, and they're watching the movie in the darkness. And in that movie, there's a wonderful shot of a big stone statue of Jesus being carried through the air, hanging from a helicopter as it was being moved to its location atop a Roman church. It gives a chance for wonderful camera angles as the lens turns from the helicopter down to the ground where some wimp workmen look up and one laughing says, hey, it's Jesus. And they wave to Jesus as he flies by. Then the helicopter passes over some attractive young women sunbathing and it descends a bit so the pilot and co-pilot can, you know, get a better look, maybe get a phone number. But then after a number of such scenes, the camera zooms in on the statue itself. And the sorrowful face of Jesus fills the whole screen. The theater has been full of laughter and rude comments, he records, yelled at over the subtitles. Beekner says, a typical crowd on a Friday night, la dolce vita, the good life. But then it was suddenly absolutely silent as everyone looked on the face of Jesus. I wanted to tell that story to get the incongruity, of course, of a man who hangs upon a cross for the sins of the world in a crowd on Saturday night, a Friday night, really kind of any night probably. But when they saw the face, they stopped. I've often talked about, let's look at the woman at the well this year, John chapter 4. It will record Jesus looked upon her in the calling of the 12 disciples, the very first one, 
James goes and tells his brother John, come and see. Come and see the man who looked into my heart and knew me. For Jesus can certainly look upon your face, but the crowd, the soldiers, Pilate, look away. They spit on him and they slap him. They cannot look upon the face. It's recorded in Deuteronomy that one is to look, if one looked upon the face of God, they would perish. Perish. Maybe in fear, but maybe because God saw right into them. And in their shame of all their brokenness, they could not bear it. But we can look upon the face of Jesus. Jesus wants to look upon your face. Even when he hangs upon a cross, and Luke, we'll read here that he is crucified with two others, and Luke, of course, we know they are thieves. And they'll record there, he looked upon the man with mercy and said, tomorrow, today you shall be with me in paradise. For even in his last breath, in his last moment, Jesus looks upon him with mercy. There's something about looking into a face. The contemporary Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas talks about the gaze of a face as a starting point of ethics, right behavior. More basic, he says, than all the abstract ethical principles and theories. If you ask, why shouldn't we torture? Why shouldn't we murder? The most fundamental answer comes when you and another human being look each other face to face. Is it any wonder that when we go to war, we show no pictures of a face? We cannot bear to see it, be it the suffering or certainly our enemy. We give them names and nicknames. We degrade them. Certainly we never see their face. Contemporary Christian philosopher who died last you know, year or two ago, British gentleman, noted the problem of our age right now in the last 20 years is that we deface beauty. He was thinking of the Taliban the first time in Afghanistan destroying the statues of, div of the divinity there to deface things to not be able to look upon each other's face with mercy, to deface beauty, to turn away from suffering. Can you see him? Can you see his face hanging there on a cross, beaten, bloodied, scarred, disfigured, as Isaiah records it, that they would not be able to look upon the suffering of the servant. But the glory and the wonder is that he bore our shame outside the city gates so that we could be saved. You know, in Christian preaching, I think all we really need to do and try is to bring people face to face with Jesus. Like that crowd in the theater, like that Roman centurion, we see the one who loved the world so much that is now forever transformed. We see the one who was above all creation but became even like us. And we too can only say, truly, this man was the Son of God. Amen. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, 
which is in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Please join me in our litany of confession. So please say with me the words in bold. Good Lord, deliver us from all blindness of heart, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice. Good Lord, deliver us from idolatry and deceits of the world. Good Lord, deliver us from lightning and tempest, from plague, pestilence, and famine, from all sudden death. Good Lord, deliver us in all times of tribulation, in their times of wealth, in our times of poverty, in the hour of death. that it may please thee to bless and keep all your people. We beseech thee that it may please thee to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord. We beseech thee that it may please thee to give us a heart to love and dread thee and diligently to live after thy commandments. We beseech thee that it may please thee to give all the people an increase of grace, to hear meekly your word, to receive it with pure affection, and to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. We beseech thee that it may please thee to bring into the way of truth all such as have erred and are deceived. We beseech thee that it may please thee to stand with and comfort and help the weak-hearted, to raise them up, to defend them from evil, we beseech thee that it may please thee to preserve all who travel, all who are sick, young children, and to show pity upon all prisoners and captives. We beseech thee that it may please thee to have mercy, to forgive our enemies, and to turn our hearts. 
we beseech thee that it may please thee to give us the grace of your Holy Spirit so that to amend our lives according to your word. Go forth this night, hold vigil through tomorrow, and may be greeted with the Easter light on Sunday. God bless. <laughs>